church. Guys, it's time to talk VBS. This year's VBS is going to be a little different than VBS's in the past. The theme this year is focus, take a closer look. And we're going to have some virtual elements and some live elements. Kids will still be divided into small groups of eight to 10 kids with some adult leaders, and they will meet each evening. Now we will have some on-site meetings. So kids will be, there'll be areas for each team to meet within the church so that we can practice social distancing like we're supposed to be. Or if parents aren't comfortable with that yet, there'll be an option to do a Zoom meeting with your small group. So don't let it stop you if you're not ready to come out. Go ahead and sign up. Now, the actual VBS event will be June the 21st to the 25th. You can sign up now. You can, there's a couple ways to do that. There's a link that goes out every Monday and Friday on the email that we send out, or I will be available between services every Sunday for, uh, for you to come by and sign up or just ask questions and you can, volunteers and children can sign up using both those ways. Youth, parents of youth, everyone involved with youth, it is time for us to start getting back together. Starting on June the 24th, which is a Wednesday, and for five Wednesdays after that, all the way up until July 22nd, the youth will be meeting here at the church outside, and we will be hosting several fun event nights. Uh, these event nights we're calling Wacky Wednesdays. Some of them you'll be familiar with, like Water Night and Yuck Night. Others like Trivia Night, Tournament Night, maybe a scavenger hunt you won't be so familiar with. Uh, we'll be breaking the youth up into teams. We'll be offering them points for things like bringing new friends to these events. And all of this is going to culminate with us, pri with us giving prizes to the winning team at our annual youth retreat in August. We are so excited about that and we are ready to have you guys back here hanging out with us. We wanted to remind you to continue to bring those food donations by for Mobile Lighthouse. They pick them up every week and distribute them to families in needs in area, our surrounding areas. Your donations are greatly appreciated. And lastly, we wanted to remind you that we are still in what we're calling phase two of our reopening plan here at the church. And that means that while we are having live services here on campus on Sundays, they're going to look a little bit differently. Uh, the first thing that we're asking people to do is make sure that you go to our website, jeffcitychurch.com. And on the website, you can find a way to register for coming to our services. Uh, this helps us by letting us know who is coming and how many people are coming and how many people are in your family so that we can plan accordingly. We will still be having a 9 a.m. service and an 11 a.m. service. Uh, just a couple of reminders of how those services will work. Uh, the first one is, is that all staff and volunteers, us included, uh, we will be wearing face masks and following all of the CDC guidelines. So there will be some doors that you can enter in and some doors that you can exit out of. It's just to help with the traffic flow and that way we don't have a lot of people passing by each other. Uh, we will be wearing the masks and we'll have masks for you if you need some. We'll also be wearing gloves in the places where that would be appropriate. Uh, the second thing is, is registering. You can register for two different places in the church, one in the sanctuary and one in the multi-purpose room. This is to allow you options for ways that you can distance if you are following social distancing guidelines and you want to have a little bit more room to run around or maybe you have kids and you don't think that they can handle the sanctuary very well, then we have options for you. So make sure you go on our website and let those needs be known. Uh, the third one is communion. We will be having communion here at the church, but it is going to look differently. Instead of passing the traditional trays with the bread and the juice, we were going to have stations, and at those stations, you can pick up already pre-prepared, sanitized portions for you and your family so that you can partake in communion during the service without anyone having ever touched it unsanitized except for you. And lastly, uh, our tithe boxes will be available. We will not be passing a tithe tray, but we will have boxes located all throughout the church. And you know, you're very generous and we love that. And we're just asking you to continue to be generous and do it in a socially distancing responsible way by dropping your money in or out of those tithe boxes as there will not be a designated time during the service to do so. We wanna thank you for joining us this morning for church. And if you're joining us from home, we want to let you know that we are worshiping 
uh, with you this morning, even though you're not in the building with us. Uh, we look forward to the day that we can all be here together again and worship under the same roof. for sure impacted my learning of Christ. She has taught me many, many years, and she always has hands-on activities, so we remember the lesson very well. The person I want to thank is my mom. My mom takes me to church every week. Through the rough times, my mom says that God is with us and meant to count on your blessings. My mom always encourages us to read the Bible and ask more questions. My mom prays with us every night. Thanks, Mom. I love you. This is for Bobby and and Barbie Lou and, and Bobby actually sent me to God and and Bobby actually taught me about God and and Barbie loves me. My grandparents influence my faith because they show me what it's like to stay strong in the Lord on the hardest days. Hi, it's so glad to see you and today I'm just showing you what how how many teachers I have and I'm gonna name them. Miss Melissa, Miss Sheena, Miss Rebecca, Miss Barbie, Miss Molly, Miss Elizabeth, Miss Jen, Mama Chesney, Miss Rhiannon, Mr. Joey, Mr. Bill, Mr. Steven, Mr. Brett, Mr. Todd. Miss Vicky. The person who influenced my faith was my mama Price, my great grandmother. She set an example by living out the Christian faith. Is my mom. It's not because she brings me to church, but it's because she gives me the privilege to come to church. It's because of her that she helps me deal with my tough situations. She helps me by telling Bible stories and then relating them to my real life situations. Church is not a privilege for all people. Some people or kids cannot come to church. I am lucky enough to have a mom that cares and loves me enough to bring me to church. This is the person I want to thank. I love Molly. She has been my teacher in church for a very long time. And she's taught me a lot about God. Mr. Joey and Mrs. Rihanna helped me learn more about Jesus. My dad has influenced my faith because I feel like not only have I, you know, been able to be around him for so long, just growing up in the church, and have I got, you know, gotten to see him uh, just lead others in the church and influence others in the church. Um, but as we've gone through this pandemic, I've really gotten to, you know, see how seriously he takes his faith, not only at church but at home, and how he's just worked really hard to uh, just make uh, this this uh, experience just the best for everyone. So I just feel like. Uh, he's someone that's really influenced my faith. Nina has impacted me by helping me learn the meaning of prayer and watching a lot of videos on learning how to be godly. Melissa, because she encouraged me to get baptized and baptized me.
Good morning, church. It's an exciting day for us uh, because some of you are watching us online and some of you are actually on site at the church today. Uh, we're thrilled to start to kick off phase two of our re-entry plan by offering some on-site services. And so I just want to say welcome to everyone today. Uh, another reason that I'm excited is because we get to continue in this series that we've been doing called The Five Things That God Uses to Grow your faith. The thing that you all just got an opportunity uh, to watch, uh, the kids with the uh, names of those who have made an impact in their lives, uh, that right there is showing you the impact that can be had when someone embraces the fourth P. I don't know if you've noticed it along the way, uh, but all of the things that we've been talking about that, that God can use to grow your faith, they've all started with the letter P. Uh, Luke started us off by talking about providential relationships, and then Luke talked to us about practical teaching. Last week, I got the opportunity to talk to everyone about private disciplines, and today we're going to talk about personal ministry. Uh, when you take on a ministry and you make it personal, when you decide to get to know people personally and try to share with them the love of Christ. That's what we're going to be talking about today. And, and I want you to just consider this. Don't you think it would have felt really, really nice if when one of those uh, cards flipped up, it had your name on it? I think every single one of us is the kind of person that would absolutely love uh, for someone, someday, at some time, to say, man, Judy really made an impact in my life. That is, if your name is Judy, or if your name is Keith, you'd love it if somebody someday said, you know what, Keith really taught me things about Jesus, and it changed my life. Well, here's the thing. All of those nudges, all of those inclinations that we might have to to want to want to be a part of something like that it all started with someone just feeling a little nudge a nudge from God saying hey somebody ought to do something about that a nudge from God saying hey you know what those those kids need a teacher I don't know what it might be for you, but I wonder if maybe even you are feeling a nudge today to be involved in something. That's how personal ministry begins. And what I want to talk to us about today is how we might be worried about if we're, we're going to make a big impact on somebody. We might be worried about our capabilities, um, our adequacy in making an impact or, or, or having a personal ministry. But what I want you to consider is this. The greatest impact of personal ministry is not going to be on whoever you minister to. No, the, the greatest impact is going to be on you. And so we're going to look at a story. Actually, today we're going to look at a couple of stories that help illustrate this point. And I, I hope they give you courage to maybe step out and take on that personal ministry. We're actually going to jump right into it. And so I want you to open up your Bible uh, to the Gospel of Matthew. It's, it's, it's one of the books that is written about Jesus's life and it's found for us. It's the first one in the New Testament. So if you're watching this online, you have the opportunity to pause this and go get your Bible and I encourage you to do that. But right now, Matthew 14 verses 13 through 16. Now, now before I get into it, you have to understand what's going on here in Jesus's life. He has just found out uh, that someone he's related to, someone he's friends with, someone who was pivotal in his life, you might call it a, a providential relationship, someone who told everyone to get ready because the Son of God is coming, uh, John the Baptist was very important in Jesus's life and and Jesus has just found out that John has been killed so Jesus is grieving and that's where we pick up with this story when Jesus heard what had happened he withdrew by boat 
privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. I mean, first of all, aren't you just once again amazed by Jesus? He's, he's grieving this loss, and yet he sees people who need him, and he's, he starts to work yet again. Kind of just makes you love Jesus. <laughs> As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. And Jesus replied, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. What's going on right here is the disciples are feeling a nudge. They're feeling the nudge that, Hey, you know what? Somebody should really do something for these people. And you know how they respond when Jesus says, you should give them something to eat? It's just like this. <laughs> they respond with empty pockets. Jesus, we're totally unprepared for this. We're unequipped for this. This story is actually recorded for us in another book about Jesus' life called the Gospel of John. And, and John lets us in on a, a couple more details. Uh, while the disciples were feeling totally unequipped, Jesus kind of jumps on and makes them feel even more inadequate. He leans over to Philip and he says, Hey, Philip, we should go to the bread store and get him some bread. And Philip is like, We got no money, Jesus. That's a terrible idea. Andrew is all out of ideas. And so what does he do? He goes and takes the lunch from a little boy. He, he, he gets a couple of fish and, and five loaves. They were feeling completely unprepared, but they were feeling the nudge. And you know what? I bet you've been there. I bet you've been there and you've wondered if you really have what it takes to, to take on that ministry. I know that I've been in that place. Uh, when I was in college, my freshman year, I did some training for a ministry called Young Life. And Young Life is a ministry that goes into high schools and it tries to uh, just get to know students and, and love on them and hopefully earn the right to tell them about Jesus. And so I was excited about this and I spent a year of training and then, then came the year where you really had to get out there and try to get to know students. And I can remember the first time I was ever standing outside Morristown East High School. I had never been there and I was getting ready to go visit with some students at lunch and I was scared to death. I didn't know where I was going to sit. I didn't know anybody there. I didn't know if they would even talk to me. I was a college age young man and I felt like a sixth grade girl on the first day of school. I felt totally unprepared and really just uncool. <laughs> I was scared to death and I wonder, I wonder if you have been there. Jesus was nudging the disciples and they were pulling out their pockets saying, we have nothing. We don't know what to do. And I wonder if that has maybe even gone on in your life. Are you feeling the nudge right now. Maybe God has uh, kind of put it on your heart that, hey, you know what, this, this Teams thing that the church has been talking about, getting, about getting a few friends together, uh, maybe you should be involved in that. Or, or maybe God's putting another nudge on your heart. Maybe, it's, maybe, it's, maybe you've been thinking about starting a, a uh, once a week lunchtime prayer lunch at your work and you don't know if you should do it or not. Or, or maybe you've been thinking about doing something with teenagers or maybe just something with your fishing buddies, <laughs> but you feel completely unprepared and totally uncool. <laughs> you don't know if you can do it, but that nudge is in there. And when you start to think about your, your missing capabilities or adequacy, or maybe you're not smart enough, or maybe you don't have the right experiences, we're just kind of like Andrew who looked at Jesus and said, hey, Maybe somebody else could do it. Maybe some kid has five loaves and, and a couple of fish. Or, or maybe we're like Philip who says, Jesus, <laughs> I, I think that's a terrible idea. I don't even have what it takes. But man, if we would be willing to step out with Christ, it's amazing what we could see. 
Listen, listen to what Jesus says to the disciples. As they're feeling really unprepared, he wants to kind of let them in on what the job is. When they say we have only five loaves of bread and two fish, Jesus says, bring them here to me. Did you hear that? That's all it was. Bring them to me. It's, it's, it's not about what you're bringing to the table. <laughs> it's not about you. It's about me, Jesus. What we have to recognize is that when Jesus puts a, a nudge in our hearts to help someone, it's, it's not about what we can show them. It's about who you can show them. I mean, think about this. If, if, if those disciples had thought about it from, from this perspective, then Peter would have thought, I, I, I want to show him Jesus. And, and well, what experiences have I had with Christ? Peter could have remembered that time that he was fishing and, and Jesus said, hey, throw your net on the other side of the boat. And he hauled in a huge catch of fish. So Peter could have said, hey, y'all, the lake is right here. I'm going fishing. I'll have food in just a minute. Come on, Jesus. <laughs> John, who was standing there, he knew about the time that Jesus turned water into wine. He could have said, hey, everybody, grab a bucket, grab a cup, grab something. Let's head down to the lake and get some water. Jesus is getting ready to do something. It makes me think that Philip, Jesus gave him an opportunity right there, point blank. He said, Philip, let's go down to the bread shop. And Philip could have said, you know, Jesus, I got nothing in my pockets. But if you say, let's go to the bread shop, I'm going to the bread shop. <laughs> because you, Jesus, will do something amazing. The disciples knew the power. They had seen the stories. They had experienced it. And yet, they brought nothing to the table. I, this is something that those of us who have been in the faith a really long time, we need to see and we need to hear. And I'm, I'm going to say it to you and you, you might need to brace yourself, okay? You might want to squinch up your face just a little bit like you're getting ready to hear a popped balloon because it, it might hurt just a little. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, being able to quote Jesus, being able to recite all of the stories, it's not the same as being willing to follow Jesus. When Jesus gives a nudge, he wants us to be ready to follow, to know that we are equip equipped, and, and to know that the only job is to bring them to Jesus. And when we do, Jesus can do the rest. Listen, Matthew 14, starting at verse 19. He directed the people to sit down on the grass and taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men besides women and children. 12 baskets were left over, one for each disciple. And I believe that was intentional. I believe Jesus did that so that they would never forget that they have all that they need to take on a personal ministry, to make an impact in someone's life. It's not about what they have, it's about who they know, who they can introduce someone to simply by hanging out with them by telling them the stories. And Jesus didn't want them to forget this. And so I don't want you to forget this. I want you to remember this story. So here's what we're gonna do together. We're gonna count to 12 and we're gonna use our fingers, all right? And so you might be saying to yourself, John, I, I don't have 12 fingers, but, but I'm getting ready to do a little something, okay? Just like Jesus did a little something, I'm gonna do a little something. So I want you to count with me using your fingers. Are you ready? Let's do it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, and then don't drop your thumbs, but do this. 
<laughs> it's your turn. You have your basket of Jesus to give to someone. Maybe he's nudging you to a personal ministry and it is time. And what you can be amazed at is not just what Jesus can do with that moment, but what he can do in your life. Because as it turns out, personal ministry is something that God can use to grow your faith. You call me out upon the waters, the great unknown, where feet may fail. And there I find you in the mystery, in oceans deep, my faith will stay. God wants to use personal ministry 
to grow your faith. He wants you to go with Jesus and get involved in someone's life, not simply because of what it can do for someone else, but because of what it can do for your faith. And you know how I know that this is part of this story that we've been in today? It's because of the story that's just after it. If, if you will, I'd love to read it to you, just kind of straight through and just let you listen. So we're back in Matthew chapter 14, and I want to start at verse 22, right after our story that we just looked at. It says, immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side. He, he had a point he wanted to prove. He, he made them get in the boat and go ahead of him while he dismissed the crowd. And, and after he dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was there alone. But the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. And during the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified, said it's a ghost. They cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Now Peter, Peter knew that he blew it earlier. You could say earlier that day or maybe, you know, kind of the day before since it was so late at night. But he knew that he had blown it. He, he had an opportunity to, to be a part of something amazing or to help out. Um, and he wasn't going to blow it this time. And so Peter, Peter says, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, come. And then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith. Why did you doubt? Jesus was constantly doing things to help the disciples realize they could trust him, that they could take courage, and he would be with them to help them do what could be the most important thing they will ever do, and that is to take the message of Jesus to people who need it. This is what Jesus was trying to teach them, and it's what he's trying to teach us. And so what I want to tell you is, if you're thinking about starting a team, start that team and see what Jesus might do. If you're thinking about starting that weekly prayer lunch at your work, start it and see what Jesus might do. If you're thinking about doing something regularly with your fishing buddies and, and, and hoping maybe Jesus could do something with that, I would say start it and do it. Rumor has it, he does some pretty good work out on lakes. <laughs> I remember I remember when I was getting ready to walk into that high school lunchroom to meet some students and maybe maybe earn the right to one day tell them about Jesus. I um, I was terrified, but I, I remember I remembered a quote that one of my mentors had given to me. He had said to me, "John, just remember you're not the Holy Spirit. Now, just, just to kind of make sure we're all on the same page, uh, when you become a Christian, uh, there is a piece of God that gets put inside of you, and that piece of God is called the Holy Spirit. And, and the Holy Spirit can help you live and follow Jesus. Because Jesus, like the Holy Spirit, is a piece of God. And so I'm getting ready to walk into this lunchroom and I'm remembering this quote by my mentor that said, John, just remember, you're not the Holy Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit, but you are not the Holy Spirit. What he was trying to tell me is, John, you don't have to try to impress anybody. You don't have to remember some great quotes or, or think that you're gonna be able to all by yourself prove God to someone. You just have to make yourself available to Jesus and he'll do the rest. So, I opened the door and I went into that lunchroom. Three years later, I got to go to a Young Life banquet. And one of the presenters that night was this blonde-haired troublemaker that I remember getting to know that first day that I walked into that lunchroom at Morristown East High School. And he began to tell this story. He said, you know, one day, these goofy college guys showed up and they weren't that smart, 
and they weren't that cool, <laughs> but they gave me Jesus. And then I wasn't hungry anymore. <laughs> and I'll tell you this, no matter how impactful that may have been on his life, I know that it did tremendous things to grow my faith, to realize that if I will just take that step, if I will just take courage, as Jesus said to his disciples, and, and, and step out of that boat, Jesus can do the rest. So I encourage you, I encourage you to listen to the nudge. I encourage you to consider what personal ministry Jesus might be calling you to because it is something that God can use to do amazing things in your life and grow your faith. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. In the name of Jesus, amen.